if you remember, we have two different type of stresses, normal stress and shear stress. Normal stress is the one that the force is perpendicular to the surface. And shear stress is the one that the force is parallel to the surface. Similar to that, we have two kinds of strains. Shear strain and normal strain. Normal strain is caused by normal stress. Remember, strain is intensity of internal deformation. Okay? What kind of deformation do you expect to see if you subject this plate to, say, stress in the horizontal direction? It stretches like that. Okay? So let's consider the total deformation, total change in the length as delta. And let's call the initial length of that plate as L. In that case, you can define normal strain as the ratio between the change in the length to the original length of the element. This is the definition of the normal strain. Now let me consider the second case, the shear, strain, shear stress. What kind of deformation happens to that plate if I subject that to shear stress? Does it elongate or do you see any shortening in that element? Exactly. So what happens to this element is that for this case, the top surface goes to the right compared to the bottom. So it slides from side to side like this. Okay? So this is the sort of deformation you should expect to see when you subject an element to shear stress. In this case, as you see, there is not any change in the length. What kind of change do we see here? Exactly. So that would be change in the angle, all right? So we have two types of strains, normal strain and shear strain. In the normal strain, we see elongation or contraction in the element. Um, the point is, deformation in this case is perpendicular to the face of the element. The second case is a shear strain. In the shear strain, there is not any change in the length but the change is in the angle. So now, let me define strains. I will give you two different definitions for strains, for normal strain and shear strain, because one of them is change in the length, another one is change in the angle. Um, I will focus on change in the length, which I call that normal strain first. I will solve a problem, then we will talk about the second kind, which is shear strain. is defined as the ratio between change in the length, which we call that delta, divided by initial length of the element, which we can call that L. So shear strain, sorry, normal strain, which we <coughs> use epsilon for that, is delta over L. The unit of strain is pretty much easy. Strain doesn't have any unit. So it doesn't matter if you're working in the US customer unit, or SI unit. It's unitless. But to make it readable, in engineering, we usually use inch over inch, or millimeter over millimeter, or meter over meter, or whatever. We call It's unitless, because they are canceling by each other. And, or we simply use epsilon for that. Strain values are usually very small, so we need to enlarge that. We need to magnify that. We multiply them by one million, and we call that unit as micro epsilon. So one micro epsilon is equal to one times 10 to the minus six. The sign convention follows the sign convention that we had before for stress. If you remember, tension was positive for stress. If I put element in tension, what would happen is elongation. So I will call this elongation as positive strain. So that would be positive. And if I put element in compression, I should expect contraction. And then I will call this as negative strain. So the sign follows the definition that we had before for stress. Any questions? All right. So again, that is the second equation that we are introducing in mechanics of materials. 
epsilon is delta over L, and now we want to use this concept and solve uh, problems. I chose a difficult problem to be discussed today in our class. This problem, or the second problem that I'm going to solve in class, is perhaps one of the most difficult problems that you should expect to see in the strain analysis problems. Okay? I intentionally consider that problem to make sure that we are dealing with difficult problem and you are ready to solve easy problem and difficult problems. A rigid bar ABCD is supported by two bars. It's a technical term, by the way, a rigid bar. It means that that bar is not deforming. If it's straight line, it remains straight line even after applying loads. That's a technical term. So ABCD, that horizontal red element, is a rigid element. It is not deforming at all. It is supported by two bars, bar A and B at point B and C, and a restrain at point A on the left side. After load P is applied, the normal strain in bar 1 is 570 micrometer over meter, or micro strain. This problem looks for three different parameters. Part A, how much is the normal strain in bar 2? So if strain is in bar 1 is given, if it's 570, how much is strain in bar 2? Second, in part B, it asks for the same parameter strain in bar 2 if there is a gap equal to 1 millimeter at connection at pin C. And in part C, it says what would be the same strain in bar 2 if the gap is at pin B. So we want to solve this problem in three different situations. Here, we don't need to use free body diagram because we are just looking for a strain. And strain is given here, and we are looking for strain in the other part of this element. So let me see if I can find any relation between strain in this element and strain in the other element. To establish such a relation, it's better to understand what happened if I put load P on that element. Um, remember, I'm talking about part A, so there is not any gap in the system. Consider this is the original position of that rigid bar. What happened if I apply load P to that? The left part remains fixed because that is fixed by a support but the right part moves downward. So something like this. This causes compression in element number one and tension in the element number two. It stretches element number two and it causes shortening in element number one. Is that correct? Okay, now let us calculate how much would be deformation in each of these two points, point B and C. We know that point B moves to B prime by the value of what we call it delta 1 or delta B, and point C moves downward by the value that we call it delta C. All right? First, we know that strain in that element is 570 micrometer over meter. Can we determine deformation in that case? So we have equation strain is change in the length divided by the initial length, this equation. Um, strain is given. How much is the initial length? For that case, it's 900 millimeter. So I can determine how much would be the change in the length. So that would be delta 1 is equal to epsilon 1 times L1. Epsilon 1, L1 is 900 millimeter. Epsilon 1 is 570. Remember, this 570 is microstrain, so I need to multiply that by 10 to the minus 6, and that gives me total change in the length of that element, which is equal to 0.513. So that element gets shorter by 0.513 millimeter. Any questions so far? Clear for everyone? All right, now you answer this for a bonus point for two bonus points. Is there any relation between delta B at this point and delta C at that point? 
using the fact that this rigid, that this beam is rigid. It's a straight line. Yes, sir. Okay, what is similar triangle? Are you talking about these two triangles? Okay, go ahead and explain what's happening here. Okay, so the length from A to B it's 240. Okay, go ahead. Okay, that's 360. Okay, how can I find the relation between delta B and delta C using the length of length that I have here? Does that make sense? Let me repeat that again, and you confirm if you received the two bonus points or not. What he says is that the ratio between delta B over AB, which is 240, he is talking about that green triangle, is equal to the ratio between in the red triangle, delta C over AC, which in this case is 240 plus 360. Okay, so what he suggests is delta B divided by 240 is equal to delta C divided by 240 plus 360 because these two triangles are similar to each other. Is he correct or not? So do you give him two bonus points? <laughs> okay, so you got it. That's correct. Do you need any more explanation? This is a technique that we use a lot for solving strain analysis problems or indeterminate beams or we use this technique a lot. So I want to make sure everybody understand this technique. Clear? All right. So now we can determine how much is delta C. Um, delta C would be 240 plus 360, which is 600, divided by 240 times delta B. I plug the values of delta B. By the way, let me, let me highlight this. I here I determined delta 1, and I replaced that with delta B. Am I correct? Look at this. There is not any gap at point B. So whatever the change in the length of element number 1 is, that would be equal to the down movement of point B, because they are fully connected together. So delta B is equal to delta 1. Does that make sense? All right, so I replaced delta B by delta 1, which is 0.513 millimeter. And that gave me 1.283 uh, deflection at point C. Now, can I determine how much is the total strain element number 2? That would be easy. That is, using the strain equation, which is epsilon 1 is change in the length of that element divided by the initial length. And change in that length is equal to delta C. We have determined delta C. It's 1.283. Length is 100. It's 1500 millimeter. I plug the values, and that gives me 0.000855, which is 855 micro epsilon. So we answered the first part of this problem. For this case, we didn't have any gap. Now I want to include the gap in my analysis. OK. In the second case, I assume that there is a gap at this point. We want to see what changes here in our solution. Let me do that in the next page. The gap is shown here. So this is the rigid beam, the red element. The element on the back, the gray element, is the element number two. And there is a gap. Here, gap means that um, when a rigid bar <coughs> moves down, it requires one millimeter before touching to the back element, to the bar element. So it freely moves without stretching that element. And after one millimeter, it will be in touch with the element number two on the back. Is there any change in this? similar triangle equation that we used before, that would be exactly the same. So let me write it down here. Delta B over 240 is equal to delta C over 600 millimeter. Let's keep it. 
All right. Now, is there any change in this equation? How much is the deformation in point B? That would be delta 1 is equal to delta B. We have calculated that before. Is there any change in that? There's no change. Okay. So that would be simply delta B is equal to delta 1 is equal to 0.513. Are you still following me? Okay. So now I can say, similar to what we had before, delta C is equal to 1.283 millimeter. Now we want to determine how much is the stretch in element number 2. Can you tell me how much is that? Is stretch in element number 2 equal to delta C? No, it is not anymore. Look, if delta C is 1 millimeter, it touches the pen. How much would be a stretch in element number 2 in that case? How much is delta 2? It's 0. Okay? So I can write down this compatibility equation. I can say delta C is equal to delta 2 plus 1 millimeter. Does that make sense? Because delta C is larger than delta 2 always, because there is a gap at that point. Now, how much is delta 2? 0.283 millimeter. I need to subtract 1 millimeter from delta C to get that. All right? So now, stretch in element number 2 is less, because 1 millimeter movement is just free movement. It's not stretching that element. It's free movement. How much is strain in element number 2? I need to divide deflection or change in element number 2 by the initial length. That gives me delta 2 divided by L2. And if I do so, it's 188.7 because the strain is less. OK, I know that working with gap is sometimes confusing. And you can find similar problems it's a bit different because the gap is kind of different, but the concept is the same. Watch this video to fully understand this. And remember, now let me solve the last part, which is similar to what we had before. Um, now the gap is at point B. For this point, how can I establish a relation between delta B and delta 1? Delta 1 and deformation at that point. Which one is higher? How much would be delta 1 if delta B is 1 millimeter? Delta 1 would be 0, because it requires 1 millimeter before touching that element. OK? So in that case, I can say that delta B is equal to delta 1 plus 1 millimeter. So that would be 1.513 millimeter. Is there any change in the similar triangle equation that we used before? That would be exactly the same. So delta B over 240 is equal to delta C over 600. And that gives me delta C equal to 3.7825 millimeter. All right? And I can use the same equation to determine strain in that element. So I know that delta 2 is equal to delta C. I will use strain equation to determine strain in that element. Epsilon 2 is delta 2 divided by L2. Delta 2 now is 3.7825. And length of that element is 1,500 millimeter. And that gives me 0.002522, which I multiply that by 1 million and write it in microstrain. 2522 microstrain. Again. The most important part of this problem is understanding how to use this similar triangle. We do have gap in few questions. So fully understand the first part, then spend your time to understand the second and the third part.